This is the disclaimer for Wildlife Control Consultant and Pest Geek Podcast for Living the Wildlife Podcast. Always follow national, state, provincial, and local laws when using pesticides and or other control methods to manage pests. Wildlife Control Consultant, LLC, Pest Geek Podcast, Living the Wildlife Podcast, Stephen M. Van Tassel, or their or his affiliates are not responsible for followers' use of the information provided here. Hi everyone, Stephen Van Tassel here, Wildlife Control Consultant, bringing you another episode of Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek Podcast family. Hey, glad to have you on board again today. And so this week I am fresh off of visiting the 30th Vertebrate Pest Conference that was held in Reno, Nevada. Typically the Vertebrate Pest Conference is held in California, but occasionally they kind of mix things up a little bit. One year, a couple of years, they've uh, they've gone out to Hawaii. Typically, it's in California. They've also done a few in Nevada. Uh, it's only a biannual event. In other words, it only occurs every other year. In this case, it's the even years. Those of you who are familiar with the Wildlife Damage Management Conference, which is sort of quasi which is sponsored by the Wildlife Damage Management Working Group of the Wildlife Society, that occurs on the odd years. So you have these two conferences that sort of uh, piggyback off of each other where one occurs in the tooth in the odd years which is the wildlife damage management conference and then the vertebrate pest conference occurs on the even years typically the vertebrate pest conference occurs in California and California where the wildlife damage management conference typically occurs east of the Mississippi however this coming year with, with the wildlife damage management conference is actually taking place in Utah of all places so they're kind of mixing things up now you may not have heard of these conferences now I did have uh, Dr. Baldwin on on, the, on an earlier show and he was talking a little bit about the vertebrate pest conference the vertebrate pest conference is the longest running and oldest conference on vertebrate pest control in the world. It started in the 1960s and we have now in our 30th uh, 30th event. So we're looking at 60 years that this particular conference has has covered. And so it, uh, I'll be honest with you, it's a bit geeky at times, uh, but of course you are part of the Pesky Podcast family, so you folks are already the elites of the pest control world because you like to get geeky. But So if you're trying to attend this particular conference and saying, I'm going to make money day one after I leave it, uh, you might, uh, but it's not going to be necessarily a slam dunk because you're going to be looking at research that... Uh, is coming down the road and hasn't been thoroughly published yet. These are going to be primarily what's called white papers uh, or peer reviewed, peer edited, I shouldn't say peer reviewed, peer edited publications. And so you're able to get a, a quick glimpse at some things that are occurring around the world. And so you're going to be exposed to stuff that isn't typical part of, wild, of wildlife damage management as a wildlife control operator or a PCO. So but you may say, well, Stephen, why would I go to a conference that I'm not going to make money day one off of? Well, understand that by going to something different, you can separate yourself from your competition because if you're just doing what everyone else is doing, how do you distinguish and separate yourself in terms of getting that competitive advantage? If you were a new business in wildlife control or vertebrate pest management, I would not encourage you to attend this conference. However, if you've been going to industry or trade industry conferences for a long time, uh, I would encourage you to mix it up a little bit and go to the vertebrate pest conference. We really need to have more wildlife control operators go into these events because we need to sort of up our game and be thinking about what are the new species that we could be covering? Let me just list one. One of them that they were talking about at this particular uh, conference was wild horses or feral horses. Now you may say, why do I want to be dealing with feral horses? Well, if you're in parts of the country in the West here where feral horses exist, they can become a significant issue. And do you know how to handle them? Do you know how to contact 
experts in the field who uh, will tell you, you know, how big of a fence should you be building for these particular things? What kind of a fence should you install for these? Is it something that you can possibly break into? Is this an area? They'll also talk about things such as uh, deer, deer control. Uh, you'll get into also some things that I'm going to touch on today, which in this case was rodenticides, particularly anticoagulant rodenticides. So if you're looking to kind of mix things up and get into a different, uh, make contacts within the more academic in uh, government level, of vertebrate pest management rather than just the industry side uh, the vertebrate pest conference is definitely something you need to attend and so it's going to be in california in two years so you may want to go check it out so enough about that let's get let me give you some highlights that i got from this particular conference i certainly enjoyed it uh some parts of it were pretty heady and so i'm going to try to give you some highlights that little nuggets that you may find interesting uh, in terms of just helping you understand a little bit more about some things that are going on in vertebrate pest management. So as I said before, it's occurred in Nevada. It just, it just finished it up. I'm, I'm recording this today on March 12th to kind of date myself. So I'm just fresh off coming. Uh, Roger Baldwin, as I said, I've already interviewed him before. He was the conference chair of this. So he was responsible for helping getting this up and running and the hotel was great and so that was that was certainly nice so let me kind of scroll down uh they gave the uh, lifetime achievement award to the late rex baker and that was uh he's he was kind of a giant you may want to do a google search on his name rex o baker rex is r-e-x and then o that's his middle initial and baker just like uh, someone who bakes gross bakes uh, cakes b-a-k-e-r rex rex baker he passed away several years ago but they gave him the lifetime achievement award and so <clears throat> the next one that's going to occur oh, the wildlife damage management conference that's occurring will be april 17th through the 20th in 2023 which is just around the corner when you think about it and that's going to be occurring in beautiful logan utah so you may want to be take, keeping an eye out for that so what they hit, do in the terms of the conference it goes on for three days they also have a uh, a field trip on like on Monday that you can attend that if you wish it's a little extra cost but where they take you out got a chance to see some feral horses and how they respond to feral horses also got a chance to speak, see someone who deals with bears uh, which was another uh, element there and then got to see a beaver dam and some and a place where they're doing some nature work within uh, the city of Reno and how they uh, how the Division of Fisheries and Wildlife for Nevada. I don't think I'm using their actual official name out of Nevada, but where they try to help the public deal with the wildlife complaints. And so you just see how different organizations handle that. So they have some, that's sort of day one, if you want to call it that. And then if the conference officially starts on a Tuesday and typically ends on a Thursday. And so they have uh, plenary sessions where they have some speakers that uh, have some prestige within the uh, sort of the uh, academic community where they're doing some sort of cutting edge research or they are leaders within uh, the, some of their publications and so this year uh, they've been really focusing on anticoagulants and so they have that and then also another element of course was uh, zoonotics and then a feral horses was another some another element within this particular conference and then they have then they have breakout sessions where you can go to track track one or track two i was in the rodent track and then they had another track dealing with feral horses and some other animals as well let's kind of highlight some of the things that i had a chance to learn on this particular and this particular conference let me try to scroll down to where uh, they had some of this. One of the things that was occurring, let me get to the particular person's name here. This occurred on Tuesday, of course. And so they have basically uh, Devi Rao gave a presentation entitled The Influence of California Ground Squirrels on Forage Availability for Ranching Operations. So that's a bit wordy. Basically, they're trying to give you some idea on 
how much do California ground squirrels cost ranchers? Now, I don't have California ground squirrels where I live. We don't have them in, in Montana. However, you could certainly, it's a reasonable thing to see. Well, if California ground squirrels are consuming forage and they're kind of you know about the same size as other ground squirrels, uh, you can at least get an idea or a sense of what it's costing particular ranchers. And so her, uh, her research was rather uh, interesting. And here's what she, here's what she found. She found that each California ground squirrel consumed 27.2 kilograms per hectare of forage. Now, remember, a kilogram is 2.2 pounds, and a hectare is about 2.2 acres. So each ground squirrel is consuming 27.2 kilograms, which was about 54, 55 pounds of forage. You may say, well, that's not very much. Yeah, but if you think about how many ground squirrels you can have in in a hectare, that can really start to add up. And let me kind of put something else in perspective here. Each cow-calf unit, which is the uh, AUM, animal unit, AUM, they, they consume 425 kilograms of forage a month. So the cow-calf animal unit measure is 425 kilograms per month. So if you start getting you know, 20, 30 California ground squirrels in a particular area, boy, that can really start to impinge on the availability of forage for cattle. And so another interesting element that she found or a little nugget of truth that she found was that is one of the issues when you're dealing with forage loss, and that is moisture. If you have a very wet year, the impact of ground squirrels can be significantly diminished simply because the grass is able to recover with sufficient moisture. But if you have a drought year, ground squirrels impact is a multiplier sort of effect. And she found that one centimeter of precipitation, now a centimeter is less than half an inch, one centimeter of precipitation, which is rain, is the equivalent to 16.6 kilograms per hectare of growth. So you get an inch of rain, you can get another 32, 33 kilograms, excuse me, 33 pounds per hectare of growth within your, your grass. So that really can add up after a while. So if those of you, <coughs> excuse me, those of you with dealing with ground squirrels, uh, it's not all in your farmer's, in your rancher's head that about the loss of forage, uh, ground squirrels can have a significant impact if the drought conditions are right and if you have a sufficient number. And to give you one more tidbit from her, and that is what would be a low number of ground squirrels? And so her plots were basically one acre in size. And so if she only had one ground squirrel per acre, that was basically minimal. If she had two to six per acre, that would be low. And if she had seven to 15, that was starting to get into medium damage. And then anything greater than 15 per acre was high. So if you're looking for what that tipping point might be for your rancher, you might wanna be looking down around at seven to 15 ground squirrels per acre. Uh, to give you a tipping point, yeah, you know, you probably need to hit that, particularly if you're dealing it before the birth pulse, which is often in, you know, mid to late May, depending on your uh, latitude within the United States. So rather interesting uh, presentation there. So let's move on to another one, which was done by Aaron Shields of the USDA APHIS Wildlife Service services. Now his presentation was improving efficiency of prairie dog surveys using a small copter drone. Now what his desire was, was can you use a drone, the photography or filming with a drone to save you time in terms of estimating and doing surveys on prairie dogs? Now researchers want to do surveys of fields to A, find out how many prairie dogs are present, how many burrows are present, how much, how many prairie dogs are on this particular landscape and can you use a drone to save time because otherwise you have to do it with a human to go out and do burrow counts or you're standing there and doing visual counts to get population 
studies. So which is faster? Is a drone faster or is a human faster? And the bottom line is he found out that yes, it's actually faster to do it with a human than it is to use a drone. He said the problem is, is we just don't have the technology yet out in the public where you can have a computer evaluate what is that really a prairie dog burrow or is that another type of burrow? Is that, you know, figure image is that a prairie dog or is that something else? And because otherwise you have to have a human go through all of these photographs and evaluate and do the counts. And if you can get a machine to do it, then a drone would be faster. But presently, we just don't have that kind of technology in the public sector. I would be pretty confident, and he was certainly, you know, the military might have it or the government may have it. But when it came to uh, researchers, it's just not there yet. So the bottom line is, for the time being, it's cheaper to do it with a pair of binoculars and walking out in the field, walking out in the range and counting burrow holes, if that's what you want to do. So that you may say, well, that's not very good. Well, the bottom line is that you, it'll save you the hassle of doing it yourself. Uh, at least maybe in five years, it may change, but for right now, it's faster to do it uh, by yourself. Uh, another presentation that I thought was rather interesting was uh, the one by Dr. Charles Eason. He is in New Zealand. He is a world-class, uh, how do I phrase this, a world-class scientist in the area of using rodenticides to control invasive species. And so his presentation, let me see if I can find it here. Uh, he did something on norbamide. I don't know if I can find it. Let's see. No, it's a uh, why I'm not sure why that's not showing up there, which is kind of strange. I have the barn owls, of course. Well, that's weird. Maybe I went down here a little bit too far. No. Well, anyways, uh, maybe there was a substitution that didn't make it into the planning here. But nevertheless, uh, Dr. Eason, again, he's from New Zealand, and he did a presentation on norbermide, which is a new, well, actually probably an old rodenticide that's kind of being re-resurrected again. And norbermide is spelled N-O-R-B-O-R-M-I-D-E, norbermide. And it is an acute rodenticide, an acute meaning that the rat will die relatively quickly, where an anticoagulant is a non-acute product because it takes several days for the rodent to die. And what he found was is that when they used this particular rodenticide on rats, it had a 100% kill. If you say, wow, that's an awesome product, we should bring it to the United States. Well, they're working on that, but here's the issue. It only works on rats. So if you're dealing with a situation where you have a really bad rat job and your regular rodenticides aren't getting it done or you want to try to change it up to use something different, keep an eye out for this active ingredient called norbermide and it will be devastating on rats. Unfortunately, if you have rats and mice, you're going to kill the rats, but you won't kill, you won't kill the mice. So it's a rather interesting uh Phenomena because you think that the same rodenticide would be effective on both, but uh, it's not. So definitely keep that. Definitely keep that in mind. Another uh, presentation was done by Roger Baldwin, and right again, Roger Baldwin, you've heard that name before. We had an interview with him on the Living the Wildlife podcast, where some research he did on roof rats. Well, he did one of his presentations on roof rats, where he was doing some research on roof rats uh, in, uh, in various orchards, for example. And what he found was, is that in the area that he was working, he found that they had rather large home ranges. Now, home range is the act area where the, the animal is basically 
performing their activities. That would be sort of their home range. And what he found was, is that the males had a home range of 6.2 acres and the females had home ranges of 5.0 acres. And interestingly enough, is that they they overlapped in their home ranges. So roof, so the roof rats were actually sharing the sort of same areas of their home range. And so there was a great deal of overlap. You may say, well, why do I care about that, Stephen? Well, what it means is, is that you need to understand that when rats are traveling that far and they're overlapping, you need to make sure you have enough traps in their density to be sure that you're trapping them effectively. So have traps in sufficient density. So if you have your traps spread out farther than you may say, well, what was the diameter of these areas? Well, 179 meter diameter area for the males and 152 meters for the females. You need to make sure that your traps are within a hundred and within 152 meters to catch the females and at a density higher than that, maybe down to 150 meters or so, just to make sure you're catching all the, the rats in that particular area. So this is where some of this research can be helpful. And what he also found, they were doing some work with the A24 repeating rodent trap, which is also produced out of New Zealand. And he was, they were attaching them to trees because roof rats obviously climb. And they were having some, some difficulty getting the rats to engage these particular traps because how the trap works, let me see if I can pull one up here online. Let me pull up the A24 rodent trap here. We've done a podcast on this particular product. And so to pull this image up, Notice how the rodent has to stick his head up inside the vertical cylinder. What they had, they had some trouble with the rats doing this. And what they found was they had to put a platform underneath because the rats were having difficulty hanging on to the tree while trying to climb and get their head up into the vertical portion of the trap. So make sure you have a platform directly underneath. My idea was, is why don't you put it horizontal or maybe at a 45 degree angle and maybe you'd get a little bit more action uh, or engagement because they have to get their head high enough to hit the trigger in order for that striker bar to come across and crush their in, and crush their head. And uh, so they may look into that. Well, this is part of the reason why you go to these these uh, conferences is to see what researchers are doing out in the field. And so, and again, the challenge was, is he was in an orchard and the rats had a lot of competing food sources. So this was certainly a challenge for his research out there in, in California. But uh, the trap does work. Uh, he wished it was working better, but once they figured out that they needed a platform, the, the traps did improve in their efficacy, not to the level they want, but what trap ever does reach the level that we want in terms of uh, its, its efficacy to be sure. But you need to be sure you have a platform. How much of a gap should there be between the base of the trap and the platform? Form, well, certainly nothing greater than six inches. And so you probably, I would probably bring it down to maybe four inches, but you may be needing to check that out so that the rat has something to stand on so he can stand up and get his head up into the trap in order for that to work effectively. Uh, another presentation that I found uh, rather fascinating was, was by Jens Jacob in his presentation, uh, see if I could pull this one up here. Whoops, whoops, I went too far. Let me get this up. Jens Jacob, see if I can find where his name is here. Oh, here it is. Use of anticoagulant rodenticides on farms, non-target exposure and potential mitigation. There's a huge concern, of course, for how do we get, how do we reduce the amount of animals or rodents that are being exposed to 
or non, we should not rodents, excuse me, non-target animals exposed to these anticoagulants. As you know, if you've been listening to the podcast here, that second generation anticoagulants, things like bromodialone, brodificum, diphethylone, to name a few, these are highly toxic products that have a very long half-life and they are very persistent in the environment. So when animal, when the rat, rat eats these rodenticides and another animal eats the rat, that rodenticide transfers over to the scavenger or to the carnivore that's eating the rat. And so therefore we have these anticoagulants potentially doing harm to these secondary exposure animals. And so what they found was that where you put your rodenticide has a significant impact on exposure to non-target animals. And that certainly makes perfect sense, right? There's a difference between location matters when you're putting out your bait stations. And what he found was, this uh, Jens Jacob, what he found was when you had ro rodent boxes, your bait stations on the exterior of buildings, now these weren't placed out on the fence line. We're talking about bait stations against the structure of that you were trying to protect itself. There was a 38% increase of exposure in mice and a 50% by mice he means the non-target mice and 50% increase in shrews so these rodenticides are getting exposing non-target animals when they're on the exterior of a building ironically when the bait stations were put on the inside of the building there was almost zero exposure to non-target animals. So if you're wanting, if you have a client who's like, you know, uh, I don't want to be poisoning the hawks and the owls with this rodenticide. Is there, is there a way to do this? Well, certainly you can use perhaps a first generation to reduce the risk. But if you really want to reduce secondary exposure with these rodenticides, you need to have them inside of a building. Now, that raises, of course, other issues, right? Safety, maybe there's children, maybe there's pets inside the building. That raises other, maybe you're dealing with a food a handling facility where that can certainly be problematic. You have to balance that out. But the point is, one way to reduce non-target exposure to these anticoagulants is placing the bait stations inside of a structure rather than on the perimeter of the structure on the outside exposed to the outdoors, which was a fascinating to have something quantifiable there. And this was some research done out of out of out of Europe. And let me kind of, we're getting near the end here. Let me kind of talk a little bit about one of the presentations that was rather disturbing, to be quite frank about it. And that was human exposure. This was done by Douglas Feinstein of the University of Illinois. And he did a presentation on human exposure to super warfarin rodenticides, methods of detection and treatment. Now, a super warfarin, if you're not familiar with that phrase, that is those second gen anticoagulants like uh, brodificum, for instance. And what this was, was research that occurred when there was an outbreak of rodenticide poisoning among humans. Uh, let me find my uh, let me find my note here as I'm uh, here it is. What it was was that people were smoking these artificial or chemically manufactured cannabinoids sort of like uh, rather than smoking marijuana, the real stuff, these were sort of uh, products that were, developed sort of in a lab and one of them was called uh, K2 uh, as memory saves as I'm trying to read my uh, read my notes here and another one was uh, spice so these were uh, illicit products as I as I recall and they were somehow contaminated with anticoagulants these second gen anticoagulants or it's possible that they were uh, contaminated by a rival gang that was another theory but people were smoking these particular products and they got these massive exposures to second gen anticoagulants because and so just to repeat that 
it's believed that there are pos two possible explanations as to how these anticoagulants got in involved with this product called synthetic cannabinoids K2 and Spice. Those were, I guess, the brand names, for lack of a better word for it. So people are were smoking this, and so either they were added to the products to try to improve the high, or they were contaminated by a rival gang to sort of discredit these products from, you know, because it, there's only so many drug users and you want to try to get bigger market share. That was the theory about it. And what they found was, is that these individuals who were smoking this and got exposed to the products, they found that some of them were, were sustaining uh, significant poisoning with these anticoagulants and the cost of treatment could be up to $50,000 a month. And ironically, they had 39 of these individuals that were ultimately hospitalized. And what ironically, what they found is that a few of them actually, after they were released following their treatment, went back and started smoking them again. So this is something you want to keep in mind in that whenever you're, whenever you're purchasing something in the illicit market, the illegal market, you don't know what's in that product. You may think you know. Your dealer may be saying, may be telling you, oh, this is good stuff, this is pure, we, we really care, but you don't know that for certain. And so these individuals were being exposed. And what he, what he also noted, and this is something I was not aware of, this was not this particular presentation that I recall, but actually, oh, yes, there was, uh, this was a part of that publication in which ways we normally think of anticoagulants as just disrupting the ability of the blood to clot. And that's true, it does. It does interfere with the, blood, the blood's ability to clot. However, anticoagulant rodenticides also disrupt the cell membrane and it has, it inhibits protein synthesis. In other words, the development of proteins within the body. These are called independent factors of anticoagulant rodenticides. And so this is a problem. You may think, well, the antidote is just gonna be vitamin K. Well, vitamin K is an antidote for these anticoagulants. That's true, but it's not a perfect antidote because these anticoagulants do more than just disrupt the body's ability to have, to clot. They also disrupt the cells of the organism as well as interfere with protein, the body's ability to manufacture protein. One of the interesting things was, as he said, that people who've had been, who've suffered poisoning from anticoagulants often have MS symptoms for the remainder of their life, which is a fascinating side effect. So what does this mean for you as a pest controller when the label tells you to wear gloves when you're handling rodenticides and to avoid exposure to these anticoagulant rodenticides? There's a reason for that. Now, is it possible you're going to be getting the kind of exposure that these individuals are? Uh, well, uh, probably not unless you're smoking it or eating it, right? But nevertheless, we don't know what the long-term effects of micro exposures are to these anticoagulant rodenticides. What we do know is when people have get poisoned by anticoagulants is that they can, some of them, a subset of those individuals will suffer from MS type symptoms. They're not, they don't have MS, I'm not saying that, and I'm not suggesting that Mr. Wein, Dr. Weinstein said this, he says they have multiple sclerosis type symptomology following these exposures and it doesn't go away. So you need to be careful. So I hope you understand that these are some of the interesting things, the kind of quirky things that you can discover going to some of these conferences because it's not just here's how you kill X, here's how you make money. You're learning things that you're not ordinarily going to learn at an industry trade event, training event, you're learning things that the researchers are finding and oftentimes you can find these little nuggets of information that can improve your understanding and perhaps improve your technique if you would take that information and then think about it, meditate on it, and then try to see where can I, how can I apply that information 
to my situation. So it takes a little bit more work. It's not spoon fed to you like an industry uh, event. However, it's where, perhaps a way for you to differentiate yourself and to get some technical advantage, a competitive advantage over those that you're competing against so that you can make more money and service your clients and do so better. Because if you're doing what everyone else is doing, how are you going to get a competitive edge? And that's my question for you. So again, the Vertebrate Pest Conference, definitely check it out and understand in probably a few months, you're going to start seeing some of the publications come out if you want to read some of these. But here you can see on the uh, University of California website, you can see the, uh, just look up, do a Google search, 30th vertebrate pest conference and you can see the uh, schedule the program of the various presentations and sometimes you can just google on some of these names and find some of their literature and research that they've published elsewhere and they're giving you sort of updates in some of their work vertebrate pest conference definitely check it out i think you'll find it interesting if you are a mature wildlife control operator, particularly if you have some employees and, and work in some agricultural or some more large scale areas, you're going to really get some benefit out of there. Do I have some criticisms of the Vertebrate Pest Conference? Yes, I do. One of them is I wish they had more vendors. However, there was one vendor there who was who had a very fascinating trap uh, for feral hogs. And I do hope that he uh, decides to come on the show i reached out to him and love to have him come on to show with a very unique design and i think it will revolutionize feral hog trapping so uh, maybe whet your appetite with that if i can't get him on i'll probably do a presentation on it myself but keep an ear out for those of you with feral hogs and they are all over the place of course but this trap is a game changer so hold off before you buy one of those solid frame traps uh, there's something else on the market that may be a lot more convenient and a lot more cost effective for you. So stay tuned. Well, I'm Stephen Van Tassel. You've been listening to Living the Wildlife as part of the Pest Geek podcast family. Hope you've enjoyed the show today. If you have a topic, idea, a criticism, something you want to send out to me, definitely reach out. I'm at wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com, wildlifecontrolconsultant at gmail.com. Uh, please understand I am always looking to purchase the rights, the, the use rights of photos. I'm particularly interested in some rodent photos, house mouse scat as well, house mouse damage, Norway rat damage and sign, as well as their scat and roof rat and scat. I have access to deer mice, so I don't need that, but I am definitely looking for the scat of house mouse, the scat of Norway rat, the scat of roof rat. And if you have access to that, definitely reach out. I'm looking to purchase some of that. I'd like to have at least 20 good samples of each of those. And I need to have sort of a guarantee that you know what species they came from. Uh, so if you have an area where you're trapping both deer mice and house mice, I, I, I really need those of you that only have house mouse in your area. I want to be sure I have the right material there. But I'm also looking for photographs as well. If you're looking to sell some of the use rights, I don't own the photos. You can do whatever you want later on with it. I'm definitely interested in that. And then, of course, understand I'm available for private consultation. I have several books available, including the Wildlife Damage Inspection Handbook. That's, just check out my website at wildlifecontrolconsultant.com. Dot com and you can see some information there and also they're available for consultations and doing research for people so would love to hear from you you can reach me at wildlife control consultant at gmail.com that's wildlife control consultant at gmail.com would love to hear from you and again you've been listening to living the wildlife why we want you to live the wildlife not be the wildlife take care everyone <laughs>